when Jill was recruited to run the diabetes trials, oh, is it 10 years ago? Uh, losing track of time. Um, I knew that uh, she would uh, begin to broaden her reach and, and uh, develop even new areas of uh, clinical research, and she has indeed done that in areas uh, such as aging, the testosterone trial that some, some of you know. So she's even expanded the official title of the talk, which was uh, to talk about uh, type 2 diabetes to include that other uh, disease, type 1 diabetes. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Jill Crandall, who is professor of clinical medicine uh, in the Division of Endocrinology. Thank you, Harry. Uh, great introduction, and I already broke the rules. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to shift gears, I think, a little bit from the, the presentation that we just heard and, and talk a little bit about um, what happens after there's been a successful clinical trial and how to translate the results of, of a clinical trial to, to the broader population. Um, and although, um, as Harry mentioned, my original charge was to talk about type 2 diabetes, um, we have such great examples of success and sort of different paradigms for translation uh, from type 1 studies and type 2 studies here at Einstein that I, I couldn't resist the, the temptation to cover them both. So it's going to take me uh, maybe some fast talking to try to get through them both. But I, but I just thought that was a, it was an opportunity not to pass up. And so I, I kind of was conceptualizing um, the, the translation of clinical trial results in, in, in a couple of different ways. You know, in one model, a, a clinical trial will result in a, a new therapy, a new device, a new procedure that actually changes medical practice. Um, and because it changes medical practice, can result in improved health outcomes for the broader population who either has the, the disease or is at risk for the disease. And then other clinical trials really have more of a public health impact where the result of the trial doesn't lead to directly to a change in clinical practice, but, but actually to uh, broader changes in, in health behaviors and, and uh, public health message which ultimately can, can lead to improved outcomes. And so, as I mentioned, we have, uh, from our clinical trials experience here at Einstein, uh, examples of both of these types of uh, translational uh, experiences, if you will. I, I want to go over both of them with you. So just before we start, uh, this is sort of a standard uh, introduction for a lot of diabetes tr um, uh, talks. And I think, you know, being in the Bronx at the epicenter of the, of the diabetes epidemic, I think uh, people are probably pretty familiar with it. Um, and that there's a tremendous burden associated with diabetes in the United States. Most of this burden uh, really is related to type 2 diabetes, which is, you know, vastly more common than type 1. Only about 5% of diabetes cases in adults are, are, are due to type 1 diabetes. But Clearly, for, 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 for type 1 and type 2, uh, there's a huge risk of um, increased risk of heart attack and stroke. Uh, diabetes has been, caused, uh, been attributed as the leading cause of new blindness in, the, in working age populations, uh, the me major cause of end-stage renal disease, uh, et cetera. So clearly, uh, a problem that really needs to be addressed. So I'm going to start first, actually, with the story of type 1 diabetes, and this relates to a study called the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial, which actually predates my arrival at Einstein by quite a bit. Um, but uh, it, as an example of a clinical trial uh, leading to uh, substantial changes in how we practice medicine and resulting in real improvements in, in health outcomes, I think it's very illustrative. Um, so take us back, uh, if you will, uh, uh, 20 years or so, um, and looking at the state of the art of, of diabetes treatment, especially for type 1 diabetes back in the 1980s. And it may be hard to remember it now. I think for those of us involved in diabetes, we, we have the mantra of glucose control being important, but it really wasn't all that long ago when we didn't really have solid evidence of this. And so the treatment approaches for type 1 diabetes in particular were just to uh, avoid the symptoms of uh, uncontrolled hyperglycemia, to maintain normal growth and body weight, especially for children uh, who develop type 1 diabetes, and that we tried to avoid uh, severe or frequent hypoglycemia. 
Uh, and what this usually resulted in, the type of t treatment regimens that were common uh, back in the 1980s, where most patients were uh, receiving one or two injections of insulin a day. Uh, very few of them were using the type of multiple injection regimens or insulin pumps, which are really commonplace now for patients with type 1 diabetes. Uh, there was relatively infrequent self-glucose monitoring. And the average hemoglobin A1C around that time was around 9%. And these are data taken from the baseline of the DCCT study, uh, but it's been replicated in, and this, this is a, a selected clinical trial population, but similar data are available from population-based studies uh, to give us an idea about what, what the state of the art of diabetes care was at, the, at that time. And I think that although there was certainly a lot of suggestive evidence that glycemic control would prevent the di diabetic complications, this is by no means uh, certain and was really actually quite controversial. And uh, the, the, the uncertainty about it, uh, you know, really led to the design of the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial uh, that we were one of several sites for uh, here at Einstein under the leadership of uh, Dr. Shamoon. So the hypothesis for the DCCT was that intensive management designed to achieve near normal glycemia would reduce the risk of, of diabetic macro, microvascular complications. Uh, and the study was uh, conducted in type 1 diabetics uh, who had relatively short duration of diabetes. Uh, there was a primary and secondary prevention cohorts depending on whether there were some early complications already established. And the, the, the protocol con, um, tested a conventional versus an intensive management, and the patients were randomized uh, back in the mid-1980s. Um, the main results were reported in 1993, and amazingly enough, the long-term observational study of the same cohort called the Epidemiology Epidemiology of Diabetes Intervention and Complications began in 1994 and is still ongoing today. So this is a, a very long clinical trial. So the, the two regimens that were compared, uh, conventional therapy, as I mentioned, was, was basically uh, di um, directed towards the avoidance of symptoms, uh, and uh, so in some ways uh, even similar to, to the approach that some patients are taking now with quarterly visits, uh, sort of general information about diet and exercise, and quarterly hemoglobin A1Cs. Uh, but the really dramatic change here um, in the experimental group was, uh, was to, to try to achieve and maintain near normal glycemic levels or a hemoglobin A1C of approximately 6 percent. And this was using uh, complicated regimens with multiple injections or insulin infusion pumps, uh, frequent self-glucose monitoring, and really the key factor here was um, training the patients to learn how to adjust their own preprandial insulin doses, which was extremely labor-intensive, required a lot of commitment on the part of the research team as well as the, the participant in the study, uh, in resulting in monthly visits, weekly phone calls, lots and lots of interaction between the study participants and the staff. Uh, and, and this intervention was very effective in achieving better glucose control. You could see here uh, the intensive group uh, versus the conventional group with a, a clear separation in hemoglobin A1C levels uh, for the duration of the main study. Um, we noticed that the in intervention group didn't quite achieve the hemoglobin A1C of 6 percent, but there was a substantial difference between the two groups. And by now, I think most people, uh, certainly in the diabetes field, and many people uh, uh, even outside of it, are familiar with the main results of the DCCT. Um, this intensive management led to a dramatic reduction in the risk of uh, microvascular complications, 64% uh, in retinopathy progression, almost 60% in the reduction in the need for laser therapy for uh, proliferative retinopathy, reductions in albuminuria, and in clinical neuropathy outcomes. So this is a great success, a very clear message. Um, and I guess the, what I really wanted to focus on now is to talk about, well, what happens next? Um, and I, I was uh, scrolling around through the, the original DPP, DCCT papers the other day, and I found this quote actually from, from Julio Santiago, which uh, was uh, from shortly after the main DCCT results were, uh, were, were announced. And it was very prescient. He said the, the DCCT may very well spawn more original peer-reviewed scientific studies than any other experiment in the history of diabetes research. And I think he was absolutely right about that. Um, the DCCT has been the most frequently quoted uh, trial. In, in the diabetes literature, and literally hundreds and hundreds of papers have been published um, and continue to be published uh, from the follow-up of the DCCT. But, you know, translation isn't medical papers. It isn't our articles in a journal. Um, translation is, uh, well, how do we use this information about glycemic control to actually improve health outcomes? 
Um, and I also thought it was very interesting is that in, until uh, the results of the DCCT were known, um, that the American Diabetes Association and other um, organizations involved in diabetes care really had no specific guidelines for glycemic targets. Um, it just was a statement about management goals should be individualized, uh, and there really was no focus on achievement of a certain level of glycemic control. But shortly after the DCCT results were available, the ADA and other organizations um, issued uh, clinical guidelines, and this is actually taken from, from this year, but it was almost identical to what was proposed uh, back in the 1990s. And now we have a target A1C, which is less than 7 percent, and tar targets for preprandial and uh, bedtime glucose levels. And so for the first time, uh, really physicians, uh, as well as their patients, had standards, had a, had a, had a goal in terms of achievement of, um, of glycemic control. Now, I, I showed you earlier, so, so, so do these goals change anything? I guess that's what I wanted to say is, you know, we have goals, we have uh, uh, guidelines, um, and, and how did this, did this result in any change in how we actually treat our patients with type 1 diabetes? Um, and I, I, I showed you this earlier from the DCT. DCCT baseline. This is from a population-based cohort that showed a similar thing with very few patients getting intensive management. Um, and if you, if you look again now at uh, these same populations, this is the follow-up to the DCCT, where since the original study was completed in 1993, these patients have been returned to the community for their medical care. So they're, they're no longer being managed in terms of their diabetes by the research team. Uh, so they're being treated by their, their community physicians. And this other cohort, the EDC cohort, is a population-based uh, study uh, from Pennsylvania. And just to show you the contrast with, uh, you know, compared to pre-DCCT pre to now, that um, really the majority, the vast majority of type 1 patients are now being treated with aggressive intensive management with multiple injections or insulin pumps, um, frequent self-monitoring of glucose, and really achievement of much more reasonable, um, although not yet at target, hemoglobin A1C levels. So yes, we have the translation of the findings from the DCCT to uh, clinical practice, um, but really that's not the focus, right? What about the, the, the complications of diabetes? And so this slide and the previous ones actually taken from an analysis that was uh, published last year uh, looking at the modern day clinical course of type 1 diabetes after 30 years duration based on follow-up of the original DCCT cohort as well as this uh, population-based study from Pennsylvania. Uh, and just to, to sort of go over the different complications, um, the observed rate of complications from these two studies compared to historical uh, uh, predicted levels is you can see that there's really been a, a pretty dramatic reduction in uh, proliferative retinopathy, in the frequency of blindness, end-stage renal disease requiring renal replacement therapy is dramatically reduced, as well as amputation, and even some suggestion of reduction in uh, myocardial infarction. Um, and so um, I think that the, the, the bottom line here is that the results of the clinical trial led to a change in medical practice, which seems to have uh, certainly resulted in, in a, in a sort of a population-wide uh, reduction in the complications that were being targeted. And just to mention briefly, this is not, this has been confirmed in other populations. This is a European study that looked at the, the development of either retinopathy or, or kidney disease uh, according to the year of onset of type 1 diabetes and showing that complication rates really are, are lower uh, worldwide. Um, now, I don't know that maybe the DCCT can take uh, responsibility for all of this progress. There have been other studies that have uh, led to the initiation of um, treatment for early nephropathy, the use of ACE inhibitors, and other therapeutic advances have also occurred during this time. But I think that the, the, the testing and, and proof of the hypothesis about glycemic control really led to si significant changes in medical practice. So the DCCT edict study was well designed with clear and unequivocal results. It led to major changes in clinical practice. And interestingly, though, it was originally designed, of course, in type 1 diabetes. It's been broadly applied uh, to, the, to the much larger population of individuals with type 2 diabetes. Um, although this, I have to say it was somewhat controversial in the beginning whether that was really appropriate. And one thing we don't have time to talk about here, but this study, in addition to changing uh, clinical practice, has, has provided some profound insights into the biology of diabetes complications, uh, especially in the persistence of the, of the benefits of glycemic control, this phenomenon called metabolic memory, uh, which uh, still is a, an active area of, of investigation today.
The long-term follow-up of this cohort is still yielding valuable insights. As I mentioned, this cohort is still being seen on an annual basis um, and uh, is uh, yielding a lot of information. But I think the bottom line that I, the reason I wanted to highlight this trial today is because it, it really has demonstrated measurable impact on important clinical outcomes. And so I sort of use it as an example of a, of a paradigm for a, a, a clinical trial uh, that leads to important clinical changes. Now, we're going to switch then from type 1 to type 2 diabetes, um, which in reality is a, much, uh, a, a problem that affects um, a, a much larger percentage of the population. Uh, type 1 diabetes affects maybe less than 500,000 people in the country, um, whereas the prevalence of type 2 diabetes is somewhere around 8 um, percent. So the orders of magnitude difference. Um, and this, I think, is really what's behind our, our concern about the, the epidemic of diabetes. Um, so there are currently estimated to be about 25 million people with type 2 diabetes in the U.S. And um, uh, of, of great concern is another, you know, maybe 60 or so million people who have prediabetes or who are, who are at high risk for developing type 2 diabetes. And that's the focus of the next study that I'll tell you about, which is the diabetes prevention program. So. Um, one of the reasons that, that, that prevention of type 2 diabetes is, is, is seems to be feasible or was thought to be feasible uh, is that we, we do understand a little something about the natural history of the development of type 2 diabetes, where there seems to be a, a, a preclinical state, in many cases, of impaired glucose tolerance uh, that can progress to um, overt type 2 diabetes. And it really isn't until some years after the development of, of of diabetic hyperglycemia that we start to see clinically the evidence of diabetic complications and then ultimately um, disability or death. And I think the idea from the, the creators of the DPP study was to was not to try to, to intervene here in a secondary or tertiary prevention uh, way, but to try to uh, see if preventing the progression from a, a, a pre-diabetic state to overt diabetes would have effects on complications and ultimately on health outcomes. So the goal of the diabetes prevention program was to prevent or delay the development of type 2 diabetes in persons at high risk. And these high-risk individuals were identified based on uh, being overweight or obese and by having impaired glucose tolerance, so already some evidence of mild hyperglycemia, uh, but not yet diabetic. And the DPP was designed to include um, many individuals from high-risk ethnic and racial groups, as well as older individuals, so, so people who were known to be uh, at, at, uh, at higher risk of type 2 diabetes. Now, the interventions in the study, um, I think, may be familiar to, to many of you, um, that uh, essentially people were uh, eligible individuals were randomized to one of three treatment arms, an intensive lifestyle arm, which we'll talk more about in a moment, an arm that used a diabetes medication, metformin, and a placebo arm, and followed for an average of almost three and a half years. Now, I'll, we'll talk just briefly about what the lifestyle goals uh, were in DPP. Um, and actually, I think the remarkable thing that, that I take away from this is really how modest these goals uh, were. Um, but the, the weight loss goal was to uh, achieve and maintain 7% uh, um, loss of body weight, um, primarily through uh, a reduced calorie diet and lower fat diet. And that individuals in the lifestyle arm were also uh, requested or required to uh, to spend a minimum of 150 minutes per week in moderate intensity physical activity. And this, uh, by and large, was uh, walking or cycling um, or swimming. There weren't a lot of marathon runners in in the in the cohort, um, but that the the weight loss goal and the physical activity goals um, were considered to be modest and achievable. Um, and achievable they were, um, and these are the, the main results from the uh, uh, first three and a half or so years of the, of the DPP, uh, where you could see in blue is the, develop, is the incident, uh, cumulative incidence of diabetes in the lifestyle group compared to placebo in yellow, and, and in green rather, and metformin in yellow, um, and that overall there was a 58 percent reduction in diabetes in the intensive lifestyle arm and 31 percent reduction in metformin. Uh, and the study was uh, so successful that it was terminated almost a year ahead of schedule because of these dramatically positive results. So uh, in some cases this is the end of the story, but 
for my story, this is the beginning of the story. Um, and so how do we translate the results of this really dramatically uh, positive study into, um, uh, into something that's accessible and available to the large numbers of people who are at risk for type 2 diabetes. As I mentioned before, almost 63 million people are thought to be in the same risk category as the people who were involved in the diabetes prevention program. Um, now, this is actually a, a, a challenge, right? Um, we're, we're going from a, a controlled clinical trial situation to uh, what many people call our toxic environment, and we heard some nice discussion about this uh, from Dr. Farley early on. So in the, in the setting of, uh, of, uh, of an assault of fast food and high-calorie foods and uh, other negative lifestyle uh, activities, um, how do we translate the message of DPP uh, in, in an effective way? Um, and so I'm just going to share with you a few examples of um, uh, attempts to translate the results of the DPP. Um, and I think an, an important one to begin with is the, the creation of the National Diabetes Education Program, which has been a joint effort of the NIH and the CDC. And their, their, their campaign that they developed uh, to translate the DPP uh, has been called Small Steps, Big Rewards. And, I think this is a you know very apt uh, slogan trying to reinforce that um, the rather modest uh, weight reduction and physical activity that's required to reduce diabetes risk you know can have tremendous benefits and so this was has been their campaign um, and the NDEP has provided a lot of resources um, to diabetes professionals and to uh, and to patients themselves they produce patient ed education materials translated into many different languages and. Um, are, are, are doing outreach with, with, uh, with that type of activity and provide profes professional resources as well, uh, websites and um, uh, manuals and, and um, lots of um, resources for, for professionals wishing to uh, embark on diabetes prevention. Um, another effort has been uh, that the Lifestyle Balance Program that was um, uh, administered in the DPP has been made freely available. Um, you can download it on the website, um, but this is available to, um, uh, to practitioners, to other researchers, um, to uh, anyone else who wants to implement um, the, the basic uh, lifestyle program that was successful in DPP. Um, and so although these efforts are, um, are very um, necessary and I think have been helpful, there's actually been a, a, an explosion of, of, of um, research efforts to uh, implement the DPP lifestyle program in group settings, in various different types of communities. Um, so I think that, that people are looking very much to learn how to translate the DPP. Um, but I wanted to just talk about what the challenges are. You know, we have this information, we even have um, um, you know, a successful curriculum, and we have nice brochures, and we have some educated professionals. Um, but you know, the, the DPP itself was was conducted in a research setting um, using individual one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions, and it was very resource intensive. Um, the uh, lifestyle coaches were, by and large, masters trained uh, nutritionists, dietitians, exercise physiologists, or nurses, uh, and the cost of implementing this type of program is really quite expensive. Expensive. Although, you know, even though it's, it's been estimated that the, actually the direct cost of implementing the DPP for a year would be about $1,400. Recent analysis have suggested that ultimately this may be this intervention could even be cost saving, um, but the the viewpoint of most health insurance companies is not for the long view, but it's really within the short term, and so even this modest cost is something that has been difficult to overcome. So so the research itself is here, but the dissemination of of DPP uh, is is um, difficult because even if there was the will or the or the financial resources that the that the healthcare settings really lack capacity to provide this type of lifestyle program to large numbers of people. And it's really not this type of intervention, unlike the, the situation with the, the other study, the DCCT, where the intervention took place in a physician's office, this is something that's going to need to take place in, in communities and a much, um, a much broader uh, uh, um, array of environments and not really within the healthcare uh, sit, um, um, environment itself. And so we'll need to have group implementation uh, to reduce the cost, but that even if the cost is less, there's still issues about ultimately whether insurers or other uh, entities will, will actually be willing to pay for it. 
So I'm going to take an, uh, just the final couple of minutes and tell you about one example of um, something that I think is very innovative and a successful effort to, um, to, to, to kind of overcome some of these barriers to the implementation of the DPP in a broader setting. Uh, and this is the, the um, delivery of the DPP intervention at uh, YMCAs. And this is initiated by some DPP investigators at the University of Indiana. Uh, David Marrero and uh, Ron Ackerman in particular. Um, so their, their thinking was is that, you know, YMCAs are, are widely distributed around the, the U.S. and it's been estimated that 57 percent of U.S. households are within three miles of a YMCA. So these are very common. We have, so we have a few of them in the Bronx, uh, although maybe not as much as as uh, some of the other boroughs, but we have some. Uh, and that YMCAs have existing physical fitness and health related programs. This is what the YMCAs really were developed to be. They have staff, they have infrastructure, um, they're friendly to the community, at least in some places. And so it was thought, why not take advantage of these existing uh, facilities to try to implement um, the DPP? Um, and this is a, a results from a pilot study called the Deploy Study, where they uh, they took two two um, uh, YMCA's that were in nearby communities that had similar demographics, and one uh, YMCA uh, group was offered the DPP group uh, lifestyle intervention, and the other group was was offered a sort of standard YMCA fair. Um, the individuals chosen for this uh, study were not um, necessarily the same as uh, the people that were enrolled in DPP in that they didn't have careful screening to determine whether they had impaired glucose tolerance, but they did have um, uh, uh, high risk features for type 2 diabetes in that they were obese or overweight, had uh, minimally elevated fasting glucose levels and other features that, that placed them at high risk for type 2 diabetes. And they were recruited into the study through a variety of means. Um, uh, at the YMCA's themselves and through local advertisements um, to attract people who uh, were interested in, um, in, in reducing their risk of diabetes. Um, and I, so I, sh I just highlight this, these, these here to show you that uh, in the group uh, uh, administered DPP that there was a, a, a weight loss of about uh, 6 percent. Um, very close to what we, was achieved in the diabetes prevention program uh, that was seen um, at uh, four to six months, but that was maintained at 12 to 14 months during a maintenance phase of the program. So that actually I think was quite impressive. Um, and also of note is that um, there was a reduction in total cholesterol uh, that was uh, seen at the four to six month and also at the, at the uh, 12 to 14 month interval, suggesting that the changes uh, that were achieved were, were not limited to, um, to weight loss, but also significant changes in, in diet that could, you know, lower total cholesterol ultimately could result in a lower cardiovascular risk. So, Based, I think, somewhat on the results of this successful pilot, um, these programs have been expanded really dramatically um, and now are being implemented in hundreds of YMCAs across the country, uh, across 11 different states. And in most cases, the cost to the participants um, in, this, in these programs are minimal. It's estimated between $100 to $350 a year. Uh, and in many cases, the YMCAs absorb the cost in, in for people who are not able to pay. So I think it's a great example of, of uh, leveraging an existing community resource to deliver the type of intervention that was found to be successful in DPP. Um, but even this uh, seemingly modest cost is something that, that uh, certainly can be an implement, an uh, impediment rather, uh, to, to, to more people um, being involved in these kinds of studies. And I think that, that this announcement that came out about six months ago is, is really very, um, very promising. And it's that a uh, major health insurer, the United Health Group, uh, has made a, 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 a deal with the YMCAs to actually cover the cost of uh, participation in these YMCA-based DPP programs for people within their insurance program who um, have high-risk characteristics. Um, and so this is a picture from the New York Times, a woman, I think it was in uh, Indiana, uh, who, would, uh, who would enrolled in one of these programs. Individuals at high risk are identified from the insurance company based on their records, um, invited to participate. Um, and so I think that although we don't have results f um, to show from this, you know, broad implementation, I think that um, the fact that insurance carrier is willing to invest in this type of um, intervention is really very promising for the future. 
So just to recap uh, where we started, um, that the, 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 the clinical trial model of the DCCT and the follow-up leading to a change in, in medical practice and we, we've seen has, can result in improved health outcomes. Uh, the model of the DPP where a clinical trial leads to a public health campaign and changes in, in, in public uh, health education. Um, the one missing piece I think we have here is that we don't know yet whether the results of the the DPP and even the public health campaign will lead to improved health outcomes, um, and that's really uh, in part the, the subject of the follow-up study of the DPPP called the uh, DPP Outcome Study, DPPOS, where we're following the cohort for the development of diabetic microvascular complications. So just to sum up, you know, it's been said that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a large village to run a clinical trial, too. And I just wanted to list some of the people here at Einstein who've been involved in the DCCT edict study and the DPPOS. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jill. Um, showing no special favoritism, and she giving me too much credit. Any one question for Jill? <laughs> Brian. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to the primary care physicians and the Monty Network and the CMO in regards to your findings. Well, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> You know, I think that um, we have an existing diabetes education program that is um, available and accessible to um, the Montefiore Medical Groups and the CMO, um, but I don't think that we have had any successful broad range implementation of um, of the DPP uh, within the CMO itself in terms of uh, identifying a pre-diabetic population and, uh, and implementing it. It's certainly something that we're interested in doing. Well, that, that's, that's something that we do, I think, participate. The management of known diabetics is something that our uh, clinical diabetes program, Joel Zonshine and Rita Luard, are very involved in directing that, and it's a, a very comprehensive and uh, certified, uh, ADA-certified diabetes education program that is widely available to the CMO and uh, Montefiore Medical Groups. But the, the issue about targeting a pre-diabetic population runs into issues of reimbursement. Mm -hmm. 